Top of the morning and blessings to you. Thank God it's not Father Joe giving this presentation, correct? It's yours truly. Nice to be with you. Two questions that came in, and I'm glad that they are. Uh, the first question is, I have been told from other churches that mental illness struggles are a result of sin. Do you feel that's accurate? Well, I've always said there is no such thing as a stupid question, and that's very, very true. But where this comes from, I have no idea. Not meaning the person who's asking, but churches who would hold that kind of an understanding that mental illness struggles are a result of sin. Categorically, no, it is not. Mental illness is a disease itself. It has nothing to do with a person's relationship to God. There are many, many wonderful people who are very close to God who do struggle with mental illness. If you check it out over the years with authentic historical documents and biographies of the saints, a number of the saints themselves struggled with mental illness, with darkness. Um, Mother Teresa, if you remember, really, as well, how people were shocked that she felt a lot of dryness in her whole life and real distance from God. And that's just part of being a human being, a human person. So absolutely not. It is not a result of sin whatsoever. I really don't know where the person would come up with that kind of an idea. That's like saying that alcoholism is a result of a person's sin, whatever it might be. So, to be honest with you, not in any way, shape, or form is mental illness a result of a person's life of sin. Absolutely not. We all have youngsters, as a matter of fact, who might be six, seven, eight years old, who are having emotional problems, and they have never committed any kind of a sin whatsoever. So just to be absolutely clear that mental illness struggles has absolutely nothing to do with a person's life of sin. What is Eucharistic adoration, and what do I do when I go? Eucharistic adoration comes down to us from a great reverence and respect for the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, his body and blood present there. And just resting in the Lord's presence is a tremendous habit and a gift. So Eucharistic adoration is just basically spending time with the Divine Lord, himself. And what you do there is whatever is comfortable for you. You could just just sit there in silence and enjoy the quiet, just as two lovers might just be with each other and they don't have to say anything. Just being with each other is such a great gift. A person can do some spiritual reading if they want. They could read the sacred scriptures or a beautiful testimony of one of the saints. Um, they could pray the rosary, or again, just being quiet and resting in the Lord's love for them. So that's what Eucharistic adoration is. And we have a surprise question coming up. Okay? The surprise question. The surprise question is, did you and your friends have any nicknames when you were growing up in Dorchester? A lot of my friends have had nicknames, uh, some of which I can't really <laughs> say publicly. <laughs> uh, my, I never had really had a nickname. The closest it ever came was, was Quinny. Uh, but no, I hadn't, didn't have any nicknames even around Dorchester or when I went to high school or in the seminary either. In the seminary, you can pick up all kinds of names uh, from your classmates. Uh, and some of them can be a little stinging. <laughs> what about Father Joe? 
Father Joe, no, I don't know of him having any nicknames either. He was such a so straight and narrow young man that, uh, that people didn't even call him that either. <laughs> so, but some people, the other guys I grew up with, you know, uh, Potsy, Red Murphy, um, Crash, uh, McNeil, and so forth. You know, those are all various different names, you know. Beansy, all kinds of names that different people have, but uh, I, I never got pinned with one. Blessings to you. Thanks so much. And if you come up with a nickname for me, that's fine too. <laughs> Blessings. God love.